this week on Core Talk. That's, that's the number one thing people remember is, uh, A, you know, safety is paramount because the people are most important, but B, it's the quality of the work you leave behind. And, and, and I, I do think that also applies to the mindset you need to have. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. We're a team of professionals, biologists, engineers, real estate and administrative specialists, lawyers, and many other specialties all working together to deliver engineering solutions that are vital to securing our nation, energizing our economy, and reducing disaster risks. Safely, on time, and within budget. This is Core Talk, the You Safe Norfolk District podcast. From harbor port deepening and coastal storm risk management to environmental restoration and research and development, we exist to serve our community because we are a part of it. Essayons. 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 Let us try. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us for another episode of Core Talk. As we're beginning the new fiscal year, the topic and title of this episode is Glancing Back to Move Forward. Today, I'll introduce to you two of the individual's project managers whose teams are dedicated to providing engineering solutions to community challenges, projects that many might have driven by every day without even noticing. We're also accompanied by the executive officer for USA Norfolk District, Major Anthony Funkhauser. We will glance back at their journeys over the past year, reflecting on the success and lessons learned they plan to leverage in the future as we move forward. We'll be discussing values and the importance of people. Speaking of people, let's go around the table here and introduce ourselves. Good morning, I'm uh, Drew Gebler. I'm the chief of the architecture section here at the Norfolk District. Good morning, Heather Lockwood. I'm a project manager in the programs and civil works branch. And I'm Major uh, Anthony Funkhauser, the deputy district manager of the Norfolk District. And I'm James Walker, Public Affairs Specialist with the Norfolk District and the host of this podcast. I want to start by having everybody give some background as to how they ended up working for the Corps of Engineers today and what truly fuels you to do what you do. To what extent does passion play a role in what you do and why? Um, Drew, let's start with you. So I started out, uh, I graduated from Virginia Tech, a uh, degree in architecture, and started out working in the private sector here in Norfolk. I uh, worked for about 10 years. and. Really, at that time, I knew the Corps of Engineers uh, mostly as a, a, a regulatory agency through waterfront permitting and working on waterfront design projects. Um, one year, uh, one of the chief of engineering, the, the previous chief of engineering came to my firm, actually gave us a lunch and learn, talked to us a little bit more about uh, you know, the military construction side and the civil works mission. And uh, I found it really interesting. I came over here, did an interview, um, got picked up, and, and haven't really looked back. Um, you know, I, I really enjoy the work that we do for multiple reasons. Um, you know, one of the biggest things for me is the ability to support the warfighter. So that was something that I don't know that I realized how much I was going to appreciate until I began to do it. And until you can see the difference that you could make in, in, in the people that, that fight to protect us and, and any little thing that you can do. So to me, that, that really uh, was the beginning of the passion in this, in this experience with the Corps of Engineers. And you know, um, as an architect, mostly that, that was my role, military construction, vertical construction. And um, However, in the past several years, we've, we've really picked up a lot of Civil Works mission, especially with this CSRM, and I think we're going to talk to some of those, the Coastal Storm Risk Management. And uh, I've really found that engaging because it affects so many people on such a law, large base, and, and I think it's a real interesting opportunity to integrate architecture and design with these um, you know, flood protection projects. All right, Heather? My path to the core really started, I would say, um, when I was in college. Unknowingly, um, I got an A plus on a, on a research paper that had to do with oysters. Um, and that, just getting that paper and going through that process really um, lit a fire, a, a passion for me for oysters. It sounds weird, but um, you know, you always think turtles, marine mammals, things like that when you're a marine science graduate. but for some reason, the, the bivalve world um, struck my interest. I uh, just got hired at a local nonprofit um, in this area, Chesapeake Bay Foundation, and I was their oyster restoration specialist. And my passion for oysters grew. Uh, my supervisor at the time had a, an extreme passion for, for oysters and it just was infectious. And I found out how amazing these critters were um, and just the trickle effect that they have on some of those larger marine animals that um, everyone can really love and relate to. And so um, as part of that job, we used to have, uh, and we still do have oyster interagency meetings and the district, the Norfolk district held them. And so I got to learn some of the work that the district did uh, beyond just large scale oyster projects, a lot of environmental 
work and I was very intrigued by that to do um, to maybe have the opportunity one day and um, that opportunity came about and I applied and uh, I absolutely love where I am now. I get to help manage these environmental projects and I love the people I work with and the mission and um, same thing. I kind of never haven't looked back yet and I'm excited for the future. That's awesome. Oyster passion. <laughs> Sir? Yeah, one, I'm just glad that, you know, we could steal you from the private sector and it's the people that are here um, that, that make this very, very enjoyable. Um, and, and you guys are in your backyards, right? This is your hometown and, and it's really, really good that you're able to support the community. Uh, for me, uh, I do have family here as well um, in the Virginia Beach area as well as, well as Williamsburg. Uh, this is my first opportunity to serve in the Corps. I've been in the Army for 15 years. Um, and for me, it's all about um, having that tangible product on the back end, right? So we're, we have a lot of things that we're working on for between Milcon, Civil Works, uh, as well as emergency management and to see the, the products and the outcomes that we're building uh, and supporting the community um, is really, really rewarding for me. Um, and then that all comes around from the people that are doing it because everyone is so passionate, right? Um, so it is just um, a wonderful opportunity for me to experience. And I don't know if I want to go back to the tactical world now, but uh, it's been great. You know, for me personally, I think it's very interesting to hear you guys to consider everyone's separate and very distinct journeys how they developed over time and what brought them to the points of intersection where they're working together on a particular mission to see it come to fruition. When I was a kid, I used to play by the James River a lot, by, down by the Richmond flood wall. And the funny thing is, I had seen that little castle, that little red castle that we have on the wall right here. I had seen that castle on that wall as a child, then in Texas, at Fort Bragg, and then in Afghanistan, and I never knew what it was. I just saw it and completely dismissed it. After all of that, I bought a house around the corner from the Deep Creek Bridge, where we have a project ongoing right now. And I began working here at Norfolk District. I would have never imagined it. So for right now, I'm going to put a pin in what I consider the impact of passion or how it affects my work here at USACE. I promise I'll come back to it. But I have a question that I want to ask you. The USACE command philosophy puts specific emphasis on commitment, communication, and collaboration, the three Cs. And considering USACE operations, your teams, its projects, the big picture of providing engineering solutions to the community. One, who decides what's a problem and what is not? Two, who truly benefits from your projects if I, as a local resident, don't get it and I don't see that there's necessarily a problem there to begin with? I would say that it's a, you know, we're, we're a unique district. Every district is unique and it, we're very fortunate that we only have to support one entity and that's the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, so it does help our focus Right? Um, we are supporting some other districts with some other major projects with Miami-Dade, but really it's, it's those entities that um, are within the Commonwealth, all the environmental agencies, all the local governments that we're supporting. Um, but there are other things that we do inside here. We got Langley Eustis, we got Arlington National Cemetery. I know we got a lot of Milcon stuff that Drew's been focusing on. Um, so I know those partnerships are also very, very important. So if you kind of dive into that a little bit, if you can. Yeah, so, so thanks. Um, I, I think for me, it, it really comes down to, um, to what we are, and, and, and we are public servants. You know, we work for the nation, for the commonwealth, and for the communities. So, so what we're really looking at is how can we benefit the most stakeholders? And, you know, some of these projects may be perceived as, hey, this is going to benefit X or benefit Y, but, but really we try to look at this through the lens of what's the national economic benefit? What, what is the benefit to the nation as a whole? You know, one test that uh, I was asked to think about when we're looking at these coastal storm risk management projects is, so, so tell us, why would this be important to the taxpayer in Idaho? to do this project. And, and really, you know, we, we started as a water resources agency and, and that mission to keep the waterways open, to keep this viable for trade. And so we're really looking at benefits that, that aren't necessarily focused on one person or another person, but how do we really benefit the nation as public servants with that duty? How do you personally benefit from USAID's projects working on them? Well, I mean, you know, personally, I think a lot of it comes to, to that, that job satisfaction, just that feeling of, of being able to help help others and be able to contribute something, you know, to make my mark on something to say, hey, hey, look, I, I've contributed to helping someone, whether it be, you know, like I mentioned, our war fighters, or whether it be a community that's had a, had a problem with flooding or, 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 or a waterway that hasn't been able to be used recreationally in the past. And so, you know, those are all, I think, personally uh, beneficial, you know, benefits that I get from it, but also um, I'm a community member, you know, I, I live in the community. So as of now, we're, we're working on this uh, Norfolk Coastal Storm Risk Management, which is, 
is really important to me. You know, I'm, I'm a person who, who lives here, who, who, who uh, swims and fishes. I don't know swims, but, you know, <laughs> paddleboards, fishes, utilizes the Lafayette River specifically, uh, you know, and, 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 and the downtown waterfront area. Um, so being able to contribute to those projects is, is both professionally uh, beneficial to me, but also personally for myself, my family, and my, my neighbors. So I also live in Virginia Beach, so I live locally. Uh, I have two young kids, so we we like to go uh, out to the bay, go to the ocean, we like to use the waterways. And so, uh, and I have, of course, marine science and in the environmental world is a huge passion of mine. It's been in my, in my blood, basically, since I can remember. And I, I really am honored to be able to help further um, the restoration of some of these uh, communities through my environmental projects and through helping um, helping the community see the value and the importance of investing in restoring some areas that you know and, and some habitats and things that you know that we didn't necessarily realize we were negatively impacting in the in the past and helping restore those so you know we have a, we've learned a lot over the last let's say, 100 years about the importance of wetlands, of submerged aquatic vegetation, of oysters, of implementing BMPs, best management practices on land to stop stormwater runoff and things, and being able to help tie that to those things to the community, show them the, the, the positive impact or the positive results that can um, come out of these projects, and then saying, yes, you know, to my, my four-year-old, like, go ahead, go in the water, jump in the water. It is clean now. Uh, I mentioned Lafayette River being delisted from the impaired waterways in 2016. Um, things like that. We want to continue moving forward, opening up more waterways, because if you ever go online and you look at the Department of Environmental Quality's uh, map, you know, they have a map that says, you know, which areas are safe for shellfish uh, consumption, which areas are safe for recreation. There's still a lot of red on there. There's still a lot of improvement that can be had. And I think everyone should, should look at that and know that, you know, even though you think the water might be perfectly clean for where you are, it might not be. So we all learned at some point that resonance causes change, both visually and measurably. It occurs naturally when an object's frequency responds to something in the environment of that same frequency. With that in mind, as you look over the last year, what do you see as the primary takeaways or lessons learned as they relate to communication, collaboration, and commitment? And what ways do you see that we maybe missed a chance to resonate very strongly with the community or we really did a good job resonating with our community? I can go first. So I'll specifically talk about my our Lynn Haven River Basin Ecosystem Restoration Project, uh, our Phase 2 reef in Broad Bay. So that project was... Um, you know, highly controversial because Broad Bay is the middle of where everyone loves to recreate. Um, you know, it's the it's a very open area for boating, water skiing, just hanging out. Kids like to swim, um, and so we proposed to put a a twenty three acre. Well, actually, it was a thirty one acre reef initially uh, in Broad Bay, and you know the community initially, of course, was was very concerned about their future ability to safely recreate in the area. And so through a series of um, public meetings and um, you know communication with the with the public during the permitting process, that 31 acre reef that was proposed ended up um, dropping down to 23 acres. Uh, and also the substrate had changed. So these major design changes occurred because, as a result, I should say, um, as a result of public feedback and comment. And during our public meetings, you know, we, when, when folks are allowed to um, submit protests to the Virginia Marine Resources Commission, they, are, they go online. And when, during our public meetings, I actually um, brought all the, the protests in. I incorporated them into the presentation to make sure that folks knew that we were taking their comments seriously, that we were addressing each and every one, and they could see those see the results of their comments in our design changes. So what we ended up doing was working very collaboratively with the community to create a, um, a, a still a, a achievable. Um, and sustainable project where we are achieving our goal, which was ultimately to, um, you know, construct about 23 acres. 
and no, there will be no impacts to the recreation just benefits you know of course when you bring in an oyster reef, um, an oyster reef in you're going to create a hard reef habitat for fish and other big critters as well as the oysters so we were promoting you know of course clean water through the oyster filtration uh, and, and enhanced fishery you know as, as smaller crabs and and fish are coming to the the reef which obviously then will bring some of those um you know maybe citation size fish and you know trying to tie things like that to them uh, and to the public and i would say you know lessons learned we did do one meeting prior to submitting our permit application but it wasn't until we submitted that permit application that we really started to hear feedback and so um, specifically from civic leagues and i think that was a big lesson learned that you know, we, we, we mailed, um, you know, certified mail mailings, letting them know to the community, but it wasn't until the civic leagues got involved that I think the community really, you know, read what was happening, what was going to, what was proposed. Um, I think they may have just kind of thrown our mail out or, or something. Right. I don't know. Cause we didn't receive much comments. So it was a big lesson learned that we need to go a little bit higher, go to a community league. Um, it did, you know, Senator uh, Bill DeStef was involved as well, and so he helped kind of get the, the word out and kind of served as um, an advocate for, for everyone um, to make sure, again, their voices were heard. And so I think we learned that the, the value of um, communication early with gained support, and we're getting ready to award the contract in the next month or so. Colonel Hallberg was at those public meetings. Um, we mean what we say. We are going to deliver a safe project where the community will benefit. I was at several of those public meetings and I remember it seemed like that face-to-face -face was definitely impactful, pivotal. From an architect's perspective, we're, we're constantly challenging ourselves to, to raise the bar with how do we tell the story? Um, and, and I'm going to look at this through the lens of, of a project that we're currently working on, the Norfolk Coastal Storm Risk Management Project. So um, it's kind of a unique uh, opportunity here, I think, for us because uh, this was not only one of the first ever of the uh, smart planning three by three by three studies uh, where, where we were challenged to develop a, a feasibility study for this project on a, on a significant and complex system in, in three years under $3 million. And, and we were able to do that, got the project approved, got a chief's report, and now we're into uh, planning, engineering, design, and construction execution phases of this project. So it's really interesting for me to see it from the planning phase now to execution where we're preparing plans and specs and we're meeting with the city and we're working through all of the questions or concerns and such. And, and one of the things that I think we've realized is that um, you know, not everyone who is on the receiving end is an engineer or an architect. And uh, you know, if you think about um, what typically comes forward in this feasibility study report, it's four or 500 pages and, uh, and, and 10 pictures, uh, you know, and, and <laughs> we, can, we can write all day. And, and, you know, we have to do the analysis and we have to get the science right. And that's the most important part of the feasibility study process. So I'm not discounting any of that. And that is, that is the lifeblood, that is the critical, um, you know, part of this that makes it work. However, we can do better in communicating this. What is this going to look like to the community? What's this gonna feel like? How are you going to interact with this? And you know, um, we use in, in, the, uh, in the coastal storm risk management world, we use NAVDD 88 numbers. You know, these are, these, are, these are numbers. So when we look at a plus 14 elevation NAVDD 88, people think, oh my goodness, are you gonna build a 14 foot tall concrete wall in front of my property? And no, that's not the case. You know, that, that, that's based on zero, zero. So you know, you're, you're actual elevation next to that might be eight feet to start. So you're really only looking at six to eight foot, uh, you know, of height above the natural elevation, but we don't always communicate that as clearly as possible. And then, you know, now that we are in the execution phase, we're starting to realize where we did or did not have clear understanding between the community and the stakeholders. And we're working through some of those concerns and issues and, um, you know, which is also rewarding, but I think that's, that's one of the things behind the scenes that we can do. You know, yes, we need to get out to the community. We need to, to hear them. We need to listen to them and we need to respond to what they are saying. But we need to make sure that we are clear with them so that they know what to expect. You know, the more that we can show them in, 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 a, in a picture tells a thousand words, um, I, I think we get better feedback earlier in the process 
and, and, and it really helps the, the community, I think, uh, understand what we're going to be doing for them. I know Norfolk is the farthest along, right? But we got Virginia Beach, we got Miami-Dade, we got Collier County, all these other CSRM projects that have large implications and impacts to the communities. What are some of the lessons learned that you took from Norfolk that you're doing right now that we are now applying to those CSRM projects? That is a great question. Um, you know, another story that one of my old bosses told me one time was, you know, Drew, if you don't finish this design, someone else will finish it for you. So um, sometimes we have to get out front, I feel like, and that's a lesson learned. And, and that's a, a, a true reality of the Miami Day project. You know, we, we started with some ideas and, and, and did come up with, I think, a scientifically, you know, uh, engineering viable solution. However, I don't know if we fleshed it out and described it and, and, and detailed it or, 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 you know, illustrated it. And, and they came and other folks, you know, third parties came forward and prepared, uh, you know, just like statistics. You can look at, you can make statistics say what you have, whatever you want. And so, uh, you know, we got um, some bad press maybe from images that were represented at unfavorable angles or looking at the worst possible conditions uh, without giving us a chance to get out front and tell the story correctly. So that's something we're trying to do more. We're trying to get out front more, to tell the story first and to, to help them understand what are, the, what are the beneficial parts of this project and how can they benefit the communities. No, it's awesome. And it sounds like over the last year, you guys have discovered things that you didn't know that you knew and things that you didn't know that you didn't know. And a lot of them pertain to communication. But let's relook at that last year, putting more emphasis on the commitment and collaboration part. Have there been any discoveries of previously unknown unknowns? There are always unknown unknowns. And, and I think one of the things, and, and I touched on this briefly before, is that we can't go in assuming our stakeholders have the same lens that we do. And each community is different. And, and while we can take lessons learned from previous projects and, and what works from an engineering standpoint, um, I think we really do have to approach each community and each project individually and take those concerns and, and try not to apply the same brush stroke to every project. So for me, it is, you know, we cannot assume that our stakeholders understand the project the same way that we do or have the same goals uh, out of the project that we do. So I, I think for me, it's, we really need to help bridge that gap to make sure we start with a common understanding if we really want to get to a successful solution. So for, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to our Lynn Haven project. So this was phase two. So obviously we had a phase one, we had a lot of lessons learned from there. We had a lot of what were unknown unknowns from phase one that became known knowns. Um, so, you know, we thought we kind of knew what we were getting into, but as Drew said, there are, there's always something that we can't expect. You know, we have risk registers, we have lessons learned from the past, we try to mitigate um, anything that could happen to go wrong um, during the process or, um, you know, things that might impact uh, the, the pro progression of, of the life cycle of the project. And so for things that we didn't really realize, I'm, I'm actually going to use an, an odd example. So in April of 23, you know, we had that tornado come through. It went right over our project site. Um, obviously, we thought, oh, gosh, you know, what, what could that have done? What could, what what impacts could that have had to the site? You know, we've been very strict on the fact that we are always going to have enough clearance for continued recreation. And so all of a sudden now we're dealing with something we've never had to deal with before. You know, what kind of debris was brought over Broad Bay, plopped on our site. So we had to, you know, figure out ways to continue um, with our strong message of, you know, having a safe project. And so what we ended up doing, and this is something that we had never done before, was um, we took our underwater ROV out and took some footage to check for debris over the project site. I uh, happily didn't see any, just some, some oysters. And then we also had an additional uh, bathymetric survey done to ensure that there weren't any shoaling to the, make sure that the depths were still accurate to what we had proposed in our design. So that way when the project is constructed in the beginning of next year, we're still looking at what we had in our original designs. Um, so just kind of a weird, you know, a strange freak thing of nature um, that we were never anticipating. And, and now that goes into lessons learned register of what we did. Yeah, and I, it's, it's always fascinating because <clears throat> you want to try to account for every single variable that's out there from the stakeholder, from what we need to accomplish, from our mission set, um, from weird weather circumstances, right? We got our emergency management team that manages mostly hurricane response out here, but you know, 
some random tornado shows up, and it shows up, and then we got to figure out how to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. I think that comes down to the the people and the resiliency of the organization. We got a lot of experience here. Um, you know, I've I've met uh, folks that have had forty plus years in the district. Um, you know, I'm thirty seven years old. All right, so they've seen a lot more than I've seen um, uh, in the Norfolk area, which is great. Um, and then it's our ability to just kind of figure out through collaboration, right? and remaining committed to those projects to ensure that we're still delivering that quality. Very awesome example. So, sir, this question is for you. Focusing on the communication aspect of what Heather and Drew just brought up, is there a difference between making people feel seen and heard and having them actually be seen and heard? And if so, as a leader, how have you seen this difference play out in your experience? And that could be here or previously. Yeah, yeah and I was, I was thinking about this question a little bit um, as I was coming into work today. You know, in, in the Army, we got soldiers, right? And they're, they're the, the single most important thing because the equipment is going to fail, but you can't have the people fail, right? Because if, they, if they're failing, then, then the equipment's not working. But they all have problems. Um, they all have requirements. They all have needs. Um, and if you're not listening actively to their problem sets, um, you're not going to be able to help solve those problems to make sure that they can be the best soldier that they can be. And I would say that's the same thing here, right? So through the hearings, all the public hearings, all the input that we're getting um, based on what Drew and Heather have discussed recently or over this podcast, um, if you're not actively listening and applying what they're requesting um, to make sure that we're giving the best product available, um, then yeah, they're gonna feel like they're just, you know, they're talking, but they're not an actual voice to what we're doing here. Um, so I would say it's really that importance and it's, it's one of Colonel Hallberg's um, top priorities to make sure that he attends all those events. He's moving his calendar all over the place to ensure that he's at those events. That's one thing that he will not hand over to me. Um, you know, we, we try to uh, have that command presence everywhere we can, right? Because we're very limited on the amount of green suitors that we have in this organization. Um, but that's one thing he, that he won't sacrifice on his calendar. Um, so what I'm hearing is bottom line, it, more than a priority, it's, it's, it's a pivotal part of the process is what it's starting to sound like. Exactly, yeah, 100%. You know, for me, it really does come down to the commitment part. Um, you know, it, it's, it's uh, I think a lot of organizations and a lot of groups say, hey, you know, we, we want your feedback. You say you, you want, but but how are we demonstrating this? You know, are, are, we, are we providing evidence? Are we showing them commitment, skin in the game? Are we coming back to them with, you know, uh, it, it, responding to the comments that we get and are we evidencing that in the projects that we bring forward. So I, I think it's really about not just uh, speaking to them and telling them they want to be heard, but demonstrating to them how have we addressed your comments and how have we made that a part of the projects that we're constructing. Yeah. Yeah. From your experience, to what extent is the application of values and focus on people a live and deliberate process? that continually nudges us in the direction of the bottom line goal, as the commander says, completed safe, on time, and within budget. I've been here for about 90 days. Um, I've seen uh, a, a funnel, 100%, you know, rapid fire of, of all the projects that we're working on. Um, it's been great, but what I will tell you is that every project that we have has some kind of hiccup. Um, whether it's, uh, you know, an additional request from a customer, that's the potentially increasing cost, or if it's a logistical shortfall where the contractor has to, you know, wait a couple of months to get X widget that delays the schedule, right? Um, I, I think we're okay with that because um, we, we are remaining transparent with the customer, we're remaining transparent with the people, um, but the things that we won't sacrifice are the quality of the project um, and then that we're doing it safely. I know General Spellman's got a big um, push on safety right now, Colonel Hallberg uh, constantly pushes safety. We got a great safety team here, um, and, and in all things we do, so we we cannot sacrifice that um, when we're doing any project here. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Again, uh, my boss told me, you know, that's that's the number one thing people remember is uh, a, you know, safety is paramount because the people are most important. But b, it's the quality of the work you leave behind, and 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 I I do think that also applies to the mindset you need to have when you're approaching these projects. You know, as a designer, as a problem solver, it, we can't just go through the motions. Um, and we're not going to, to achieve what we really could. Yeah. You know, and, and to me, it's all about your work ethic and how you approach that work. And, and one time my boss told me, you know, hey, this, 
does this paper do I see here, do, do these plans and specs, does this represent who you are as a professional? And, and that's the way I like to encourage my staff to think about this. This work should be a part of who you are. And, and if it is, then, then I think it's going to reflect highly. I think, I, I think that's a great point and something that now I want to take to my teams. And, and I, we always say, you know, um, you know, after we construct a project, would you want to be in the area? Would you want to be swimming? And because um, going in front of the public, I wanted to be able to say, you know, I will still look for example, I'm bringing Lenny even up again. I will still, you know, take a boat over the reef. I would still still swim in there. Um, you know, if you, if I wasn't going to do it, then I would not feel comfortable. And so, if I can't get behind something, then why would I expect the public to? James, I, th- I think that's I'm like going full circle back to your original comment about that logo, right? Um, that logo means something when you see it in the community. It's that level of quality that comes with our name. Um, and if we're not proud of the projects that we're putting out there and, and looking at those logos when we see it, um, you know, that, that kind of shows a lot of, about how we are and how we do business. Because when I see those logos, I'm extremely proud of the products that we're putting out there in the community. Man, it takes us right back to pride again. Thank mm-hmm. you for that, sir. So bringing this conversation to a close, what do you look forward to in this upcoming fiscal year as we work towards the accomplishment of our mission? to provide engineering solutions for some of the community's toughest problems. How do you foresee yourselves applying some of the lessons learned over the past year moving forward? Well, for me, I think um, I, I mentioned, you know, I've, I've really kind of cut my teeth in the MILCON program, but here this fiscal year, as um, Major Funkhauser mentioned, you know, we're, we're working the uh, execution phase of the Norfolk CSRM. We're working the planning phases for the Virginia Beach CSRM and with our partners in Miami-Dade County, as well as Collier County. So for me, um, I want to continue to push the envelope in terms of our communication and our, our visualization for these CSRM projects and, and challenge ourselves to say, how can we continue to elevate the expectations for what we do as architects and designers within the realm of civil works? So that, that's really my goal for this fiscal year. I think for my teams, um, I'm lucky enough to have a lot of my projects have a lot of the same PDT members. So we, are, and we're all kind of growing, growing up together. We're learning through everything. We have lessons learned out the, you know, huge lessons learned registers in the, um, in our, in each of our project folders. And with each project, we're getting more and more efficient and we are getting, um, more and more innovative. And so I'm looking forward to now as each of my team, they're kind of becoming um, subject matter experts in some of these ecosystem restoration projects. I'm looking forward to the same thing, kind of pushing the envelope, figuring out how can, how can the Norfolk district be innovative in our designs to, um, you know, figure out ways to increase the um, overall habitat benefits of an area, um, taking into account things like sea level rise, looking forward, um, you know, into the future, creating sustainable projects, um, and just, you know, doing more nature-based features and, and things like that, and just I guess, bottom line, just continuing to innovate and be on the cutting edge of um, just trying to make this community a healthier, um, better place to live. That's great. Just like you said, like tons of CSRM projects, tons of local environmental projects, um, Lynn Lynn Haven being one of our biggest ones. Um, We got a lot going on in the district. Um, we continue to grow our project portfolio. We continue to grow in size. Um, you know, just sitting in budget meetings where, um, you know, one of the largest uh, sizes in terms of personnel that we've ever seen in the district. So we're continuing to grow this great place, bringing on more and more great people into the organization. And that's what we need. So we're still hunting for people. If you guys want to come in and join this great team. Um, but fiscal year 24 and, and calendar year 24 have a lot of great projects across um, civil work side of the house. Um, as well as the Milcon side of the house. So we look forward to it, and and I'm pumped just to see more of the projects and and doing more site visits and meeting all the great people on the team. So I told you guys I was going to put a pin in a topic of passion for me, and I would come back to it at the end. So here it is. I am passionate about, actually about working here. I know that sounds extremely cheesy. It sounds incredibly like, of course he's going to say that, right? But it is, it is awesome to be part of an organization that has so many individuals, competent individuals, professionals that really care about each other and care about seeing each other's projects be successful. It's really awesome to be in a part of an organization that 
is so committed to helping our community flourish. My kids, I, I'm a resident here now in this area, in a local area. My kids go to school here, they, go, they get into the water here. And my son is going to be joining the military soon. And he's probably, if he gets stationed at Fort Eustis, where I know that you worked on a barracks building, the, th the things that we don't know, that we don't know, right? Yeah. This is one of the unknowns, like to work a part and be a part of an organization where I can realize some of my unknown unknowns is really awesome. And it's really great to get to work with you guys on a daily basis. So, that being said, this is the end of our podcast. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Core Talk. Whether it's during the feasibility study of a coastal storm risk management project or in the comment section of this podcast, we want you to know that your voice is needed, your feedback is needed, because it helps us go a long way when it comes to operating more effectively. So please remember to like, share, subscribe. If you feel that you want to leave a comment or send us a direct message about topics you'd like to hear in upcoming episodes, please do so. We'd love to hear from you as we continue on this journey. All right. Thanks, James. Thank you guys, yes, sir. Thank both of you.